I just have to begin by saying my heart is bursting um, with pride to be standing and to be here with you uh, this evening. I, I, I was able to listen to the lectures earlier today and, and I'm so proud of all of the women in this room and I am really um, inspired by your thoughtful um, criticism of some of the status quo that we know um, works to hold women back, um, but I am also deeply moved by your inspiration and your motivation to continue um, the kind of change that we all learned was possible when we were here as students. My name is Alana Odoms Abair, and I am a member of the class of the IWL of 2002. And that means I am vintage to some, we heard that uh, language used. I am an OG to others, like big up to whoever called me an OG, old gangster. Um, maybe one of the originals along with Mary, my classmate Janine Gian Freddie. Um, it's unbelievable that we're talking now 20 years of, of life lessons and leadership um, and I am I'm honored to be here. I want to say, uh, I owe an incredible debt of gratitude to every single woman at this table and honestly, every woman in this room. But in particular, thank you so much for thinking of me for this special honor, Lisa Hetfield, uh, Mary Trigg, Mary Hartman, founding director Mary Hartman, Sasha Tanner. This invitation and what it means about my own growth and development as a woman leader um, speaks beyond what I can express in words. It feels incredibly good to be home, y'all. I say y'all now because I've been living in New Orleans for 12 years. I'm a Jersey girl, born and raised, um, born and raised in Jersey City. My family, um, we still have our family home in Edison, um, but I haven't been back to campus since I graduated. So this is my first time back, and I can say it feels really, really good. Um, there's so much psychological space uh, safety in this room, not just because we're aligned on vision and purpose and mission, but because we actually have each other's back and we support one another, so I want to appreciate that and acknowledge that. I also want to make a confession. I was a Rutgers College student, but I pretended mm -hmm. to be a Douglas girl. <laughs> because I was all up in this building and I was across the street and, and Lisa outed me. She told me when she picked me up from the hotel today, she says, Alana, I know you were Rutgers College. Like, no! She knew all she knew all along. She just never said, see that's the kind that's the kind of support you get here. They let you think that they don't know that they but they know. They know. We are celebrating 20 years of the IWL today. I was 20 years old when I graduated from this, this very incredible program. One thing that I can tell you that is different about me, the 20 year old, that is different than the IWL at 20, is the IWL is certainly far more sophisticated than I was at 20. <laughs> it is far more interesting. It has a lot more friends. A lot more friends with money, that's true for sure. Uh, but like a true millennial, the IWL today has enlisted Tens of tens and dozens of friends and followers to sing its well-deserved praises and post FOMO-inducing selfies on our Instagram feeds about how cool this event is. Hashtag IWL 20th anniversary celebration is lit. <laughs> now, for all the folks in the room who don't know what FOMO is, it means fear of missing out. So everybody here will be posting pictures about how cool this was and so sad that they weren't here to join us. <laughs> and that is for all my 20-somethings. I want to give a shout out to my 20-somethings. How many 20-somethings in the room? Give them a hand. All my millennial ladies. We see you and we love you, the vintage of us. We adore you, actually. And <laughs> You are precious and loved. And when I heard about the founding of this program and the fact that that idea came from an undergraduate student, we treasure you. We treasure those incredible minds that are willing to push beyond the boundaries that some of us who have are more mature 
have started to accept certain things and you guys just don't accept those things and so I want to say and acknowledge that I see you in the room and that we honor you here tonight too. Shout out to our women's studies professors. So these are the women who are shepherding these incredible minds and who come back year after year. They're almost like um, Broadway performers. They do the same performance every night, but they never show that they don't have that same love and fire in their belly every time they do it. And that is real. That is such an incredible gift that you bring us something new every single time. And every single time you give us that space and opportunity to take what you're giving us and to grow and to change. It is so beautiful. It really, really is, and such a gift. Y'all already heard, I'm the executive director of the ACLU of Louisiana, and um, that's a big name and title, but no. I, you know, I'll, I'll be really candid, because I feel like I'm among family in this room. I didn't feel up to that challenge um, when I first thought about taking the position, and it was really drawing on the advice and guidance that I got from women in this room and from people like my mom and other mentors and leaders that really helped me um, believe in myself more deeply and believe that I had the appropriate training that I needed to step into this role. So at the ACLU, we talk a lot about the founding fathers, right? The framers, the drafters of the Constitution, and the fundamental inalienable rights of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness that are endowed to everyone within our borders. However, as we all know far too well, the framers did not contemplate everyone in that promise of justice. Many of the folks in this room were not contemplated. My organization fights in courts, in state legislatures, in Congress, and in communities to protect the rights of immigrants, refugees, and indigenous people, people of color. We defend reproductive rights, women's rights, and we work on behalf of the LGBT community and those who are incarcerated. We work to ensure that the fundamental rights guaranteed by the Constitution and the Bill of Rights are in practice, and not only in theory, extended to all. That is the beauty of our democracy. It is a project of transformation, which is a phrase that we're familiar with in this building, and demands the involvement and work of the people, we the people, in order to form a more perfect union and to ensure the promise of equality to all. On this, the 20th anniversary of the IWL, we are here to recognize a different set of framers. We are here to pay tribute to a movement for women's liberation that began as a spark and grew into the fire of feminist leadership that burns so deeply throughout this building and on this campus. This did not come about on its own. It took women who raised their hands and took up the project of bending the arc of history toward justice for women. On the banks of the old Raritan, <laughs> these women began conspiring some two decades ago to ensure, <laughs> to ensure a more fair and just society for women at this university and in this country. The founding mothers of the IWL, here with us tonight, Mary Hartman, Mary Trigg, Lisa Hetfield, Charlotte Bunch, and others who remain unnamed but who are recognized here tonight. Standing on the shoulders of women pioneers who came before them, envisioned an academic program where a woman's inalienable rights to freedom and equality were not just a promise, but in fact, a reality. These founders envisioned a space where women are protected and where their unique experiences and capacity could be realized. The framers of this program recognized that when women lead, lives are changed for the better. 
The framers of this program crafted a curriculum based on the basic premise that women's rights are human rights and that voices of women should be amplified, studied, and honored. The framers of the IWL demystified the question of whether leaders are in fact made or born by answering in the affirmative, simply yes. A drastic departure from a didactic, masculine-centered approach to leadership, this program inspires the courage women need to seek the highest calling of themselves, whatever that might be, and to go confidently toward the expression of that unique calling. The IWL, moreover, invests in women. It invests with educational opportunities, with jobs, with relationships, with mentorship, with sponsorship, with support. Y'all, it walks the walk. It doesn't just talk the talk. That's the real thing about this program. And as I said in my commencement remarks almost 20 years ago, these gifts are completely priceless. And I still believe that today. This grand experiment in women's leadership has created a cascade of empowerment that has directly touched the lives of more than 300 alumni from this program. And we, the women of the IWL, we, the people, as a collective body, are using the core values of self-determination, human dignity, peace, justice, freedom, which were all instilled in us by this program to empower our work for women's liberation all over this country. IWL scholars are breaking down glass and concrete ceilings at Instagram and Google and companies that are far more diverse than just those, but just to name a few. We are blazing trails in schools, thank you vanity, in academia, in medicine, in law, media, journalism, finance, business, art, music, theater, social activism, government, and the list goes on and on and on. That is what you are doing. That is what you have done, and that's what we are doing together. We are reaching back and bringing other sisters with us when we travel through the halls of power. And if we aren't, here's a gentle reminder that we should be. We were taught better than that. We are preparing a seat at the table for our sisters who have yet to be invited. And if we are not, we should be. We were taught better than that. What's more, we believe deeply in our inherent right to be at the table even at the head of the table, by virtue of the early teachings we received around the seminar table just upstairs. <laughs> and we are committed to women's liberation because we acknowledge the debt that was paid for us. And we realize that our own liberation is bound up in the liberation of our sisters. For the last 12 years, I have committed myself to the cause of racial justice and working to end mass incarceration in Louisiana. I don't want to spend too much time talking about myself. That is a problem that I still am working on, but I am trying. So I will <laughs> indulge just a bit because I know there are young people in the room who have questions about this journey and how it came to be. I began this journey as a young lawyer at the district attorney's office in New Orleans. <coughs> Over the course of two years as a prosecutor, I realized that outcomes in our criminal justice system are not defined by guilt or innocence, but rather by race and by poverty. Being rich and guilty is often better than being poor and innocent. Louisiana led the world in incarceration per capita, nearly double the national average of 816 per every 100,000 people in prison. What is more, the criminal justice system, as I said, was rife with racial disparities, with African-American folks making up just 30% of the state's population, but comprising more than 60% of the incarcerated population. I knew this needed to change, and I wanted to be a change agent, and I wanted to be a part of that change. So unfortunately, I knew that I could not do that within the confines of the district attorney's office, despite how much I wanted that change to occur from the inside. We talk a lot about inside, outside ball game, and how you, how you know when you can go inside, outside. So I spent time inside and then realized, OK, we got to kick these doors. we got to get outside. I witnessed how unnecessary incarceration destroys lives and families and communities. And I made a commitment to myself that I would one day work to change the laws that I had one 
time used to prosecute people and so many people who I now and even then believed should not have been prosecuted. Later, as Deputy General Counsel of the Louisiana Supreme Court, I spearheaded the work of the Louisiana Justice Reinvestment Task Force, a group of experts representing law enforcement, the judiciary, public defense, and legislators charged with making recommendations to pass a sweeping criminal justice reform package in Louisiana. In order to do this, though, I realized that you cannot make change without centering the leadership of directly impacted people. The people who are closest to the problem are the people who are closest to the solution. So despite my belief, my academic training, my understanding of the situation, it was not simply incumbent upon me to try to impose change from the top down. That change had to flow from the community up. And so we worked on a statewide community education campaign and town hall series to allow task force members to hear the stories of our citizens. More than 5,000 directly impacted community members attended the series of gatherings. And at these meetings, citizens recounted horror stories of losing parents, spouses, and children to the prison system for very low-level nonviolent offenses, things that many of us have probably done in our own lives. I also visited the Angola State Penitentiary and countless parish prisons to better understand the experiences of incarcerated people. And notice I do say incarcerated people, I do not say convicts, I do not say offenders, I do not say felons or ex-felons because what we have to remember about any work that we do is that it is always centered around people, people who have involvement in the criminal justice system. We cannot forget human dignity and the importance of recognizing people at the center of our work. We heard so much of this from our colleagues. It is incumbent upon us from the training that we've received to help others understand that everything we do has to center around the value, the inherent value of people. I used the lessons that I had learned as a district attorney, some of those very difficult lessons, to inform my advocacy during the task force deliberations and before the legislature. And in June of 2017, the Louisiana legislature passed a suite of 10 packed 10 bills proposed by the task force, which had strong bipartisan support, which would eliminate certain mandatory minimums, narrow sentencing ranges for drug possession, expand probation eligibility for nonviolent folks, and essentially transform our criminal justice system in Louisiana. Um, we still have a long way to go, um, but this package was deemed by the New York Times and others who wrote about it as historic based on where Louisiana has come from. With the ambitious package, the state will save $262 million and reinvest $184 million of that, uh, or 70% into programs that we know help and heal substance abuse, addiction, mental health disability, and things that we know actually drive folks to commit crimes because it's actually not because people are inherently bad or they, they, want, they don't want the same things for their families, they don't want good things. It's because they don't have the same opportunities that we've been given and so we are responsible for helping drive change through laws, through policy that reflect that understanding. We are in a moment in history where marginalized people are rising up and resisting in every corner of our society. We've spoken about the Me Too movement, the resurgence of the women's movement, human dignity movements resisting family separation and the Muslim ban, movements to end senseless gun violence in America and Black Lives Matter, and the movement to end mass incarceration. And this list, too, goes on and on. At the ACLU, we believe that we should kneel with CAP. Colin Kaepernick, because we know that racism will not cure itself, and because we must dismantle the sexism and racism that pervade our criminal justice system in which women of color are currently the fastest growing segment of the prison population. It's all intersectionality, y'all. We stand with sexual assault survivors because allowing a culture of sexual violence and abuse to go unchecked in our society doesn't just hurt women, it hurts men too. We must ensure people can live their lives free from gender-based violence and harassment, and we are committed to that at the ACLU. We march with the young people from Parkland because walking into school shouldn't be a life or death decision for our children. 
We fought for marriage equality in the court because love and commitment are simply that, love and commitment. We shout Black Lives Matter because we must ensure a vision of gender justice that recognizes our intersecting identities and demands an end to the many forms of oppression that we experience. We lock arms with immigrant families because life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness are their birthrights too. I see my work at the ACLU as a direct extension of the teachings I received in this building. We have all been given a tremendous gift as scholars in this program, one that we certainly do not take for granted. We, the women of the IWL, must remember that significant progress often comes slowly and with great effort, and that no victory ever stays won. Therefore, we must be patient but steadfast and even relentless. Audre Lorde said, when I dare to be powerful, to use my strength in the service of my vision, then it becomes less and less important whether I am afraid. In our own unique ways, each of us is a social engineer, tinkering with the status quo, calculating and plotting a new path forward, bending and bending the arc of history a little more closely toward justice for women, for girls, and for all who need our care. We need not be afraid of the challenges that lie ahead, though they are great, because we are powerful and because we have vision. I am grateful to the IWL for helping to cultivate the vision that I had as a sweet little 18-year-old girl, and I am tremendously grateful for the opportunity to be here at 38, all grown up to wish the IWL a very, very happy 20th birthday. Mm -hmm.